In this video, we are going to be exploring the topics in chapter 16 and 17, which include carbohydrates and their metabolism through the process of glycolysis. First, we are going to be looking at sugars and their structures and their stereochemistry. So, when it comes to sugars, understand that they have the molecular formula CnH2O-N. That's why sugars are also known as carbohydrates. And if we look at that general molecular formula, you can see that they are hydrates of carbon. And that's where the word carbohydrates come from. They are a major source of energy in our diet. That's why they are necessary. And carbohydrates are going to be made from the elements carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. There are many sources of carbohydrates that can come in our diet. And as you can see on the picture that we have on the right, they include bread, pasta, potatoes, etc. Now, one of the things is that plants through the process of photosynthesis can take CO2, water, and energy and convert them into a carbohydrate. In this case, glucose is a mono saccharide meaning there's only one unit of sugar and in the process also oxygen molecular oxygen is produced now for us we cannot produce sugar what we can do is metabolize it and for us we do the reverse reaction and in this reverse reaction, we're going to take our, in this case, glucose, our carbohydrate, we're going to react it with oxygen, and we're going to be producing CO2, water, and energy. So that means that every time we are res um, going through the process of respiration, what we're doing, in other words, is combusting A sugar and the reason why I use the word combustion is because in general chemistry we learn that whenever we have and also in organic chemistry we learn that if we have compounds that contain carbon hydrogen and oxygen and you expose them to O2 the products are CO2 energy and water so the beauty of the system and how nature has designed all of this is that whenever we eat sugar we do not explode as we're going to be talking about the metabolism of sugars, we're going to see that this energy is actually released little by little instead of all at once, which is what we have observed previously in combustion reactions. So I already introduced to you guys the term saccharide, but just mean that saccharides means sugars. There are different types of carbohydrates and the three that we're going to be exploring throughout the presentation are monosaccharides, which is the simplest carbohydrate. It is one unit of sugar. We also have disaccharides, which consist of two monosaccharides coming together. And we also have polysaccharides. In other words, oligosaccharides. And oligosaccharides are going to have many, many, many units of monosaccharides. Now, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that these sugars can undergo the process of hydrolysis. But notice that only disaccharides and polysaccharides can be hydrolyzed. The reason why monosaccharides do not undergo the process of hydrolysis, it doesn't matter if it's with acid and water or enzymatic, is because you already have one unit of sugar. So you cannot hydrolyze it into something different. So understand that only disaccharides can be hydrolyzed enzymatically or with the presence of acid to produce the two monosaccharide molecules that are present in the molecule and polysaccharides with many molecules of water 
through acidic conditions or enzymatic conditions can produce many monosaccharides. We also have trisaccharides, tetrasaccharides, but we are not going to be discussing those in this chapter. Let's now focus on monosaccharides and let's look at their structures. So understand that monosaccharides are going to be consisting of three to eight carbon chains in length, okay? They are also going to be having a carbonyl group. Now, this carbonyl group that is going to be present in our monosaccharides can be an aldehyde group. So if your monosaccharides contain an aldehyde group, then that is going to known, uh, be known as an aldose. While if a monosaccharide contains a ketone group, it's going to be known as a ketose. Now, one of the other things that we need to take into account is that when it comes to monosaccharides, we also have hydroxyl groups, okay, on all of the carbons except for the carbonyl group. One of the things, and we're going to be exploring this a little bit uh, more later, is like, keep in mind the number of chiral centers in sugars. In this case, we are focusing on monosaccharides. Now, we can also classify monosaccharides according to the number of um, carbon atoms that they have. So. As I mentioned before, the number of carbons present in monosaccharides is going to be three to eight carbon atoms. So if your monosaccharide has three carbon atoms, then that is known as a triose. If your monosaccharide has four carbons, then that's known as a tetrose. If it has five carbon atoms, that is known as a pentose. If it has six carbon atoms, that is known as a hexose. Seven carbon atoms will be a heptose. Eight carbon atoms will be an octose. Now, to give you guys um, examples of different monosaccharides, here we have glucose and fructose. And understand that we, if we classified a monosaccharide using the carbonyl functionality plus the number of carbons. If you have an aldose, like what we see in glucose, and remember that it is an aldose because it has an aldehyde, we are just going to write down the word aldo, and that's going to be the first word. Then, when it comes to the number of carbons, glucose specifically has one, two, three, four, five, six, so that means that we know it as a hexose, And we're going to write the word hexose next to aldo. So, that's where the classification aldohexose comes from. For another example of a monosaccharide, as you can see, that is fructose. And fructose is a ketohexose. So, I'm just going to highlight why it's called a ketohexose. So, the keto portion comes from... The C double bond O, bonded to carbon, bonded to carbon. So that is the ketone motif in fructose. And then the hexose portion comes from having one, two, three, four, five, six carbons. Whenever we're talking about the stereochemistry of monosaccharides, understand that we need to at least think about Fischer projections.
And Fisher projections, as you can see by, a def by definition, is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional structure. It utilizes vertical lines in place of dashes for bonds that go back, and it uses horizontal lines in place of wedges for bonds that are coming forward. So in organic chemistry, whenever we wanted to symbolize that we were having a molecule that has a three dimension, we use wedges. in dashes but in biochemistry when we are trying to illustrate molecules in this way specifically when it comes to monosaccharides understand as it was explained before that the wedges are our horizontal line where our dashes, meaning the bonds that are looking back, are going to be in a vertical line, okay? So understand that even though it is not written at times, here in the intercept of your vertical line and your horizontal line lives a carbon atom. And I'm just going to write it in. In this carbon atom, if we look at the attachments that are surrounding it, it is a chiral carbon, because it has four different groups attached to it. As I mentioned before, as we continue progressing and talking about stereochemistry, keep in mind the number of chirocarbons that are uh, present in monosaccharides. So one of the things um, that I want to specify when it comes to this is that when we are writing Fisher projections, for this class, just because it's online, you guys will not be submitting structures. But if given a Fisher projection, you need to know what the structure means. Now we are going to talk about the D and L notations that is utilized for monosaccharides. So I know that in organic chemistry, we focused a lot um, in determining R and S configurations? Well, when it comes to biochemistry, we do D and L notation. Now, understand that D and L isomers are going to depend specifically on the position of the OH that it is on the chiral carbon that is the farthest away from the carbonyl group. The reason why I specify this is that I'm going to be looking at the molecule of erythros. And as you can see, if we look at the molecule of erythros, and I'm just going to highlight the atoms, we have one, two chiral carbons, okay? But the one that determines if we have a D configuration of our monosaccharide or an L configuration of our monosaccharide is going to be This one, the one that I wrote in in red, because that is the chiral carbon that is the farthest from the carbonyl group. OK, now we are going to be observing specifically at the OH group. As you can see in the L configuration, our OH is going to be on the left. If we have a D notation, it is on the right. So even though we have many chiral centers in monosaccharides, D and L notation is determined, as I just explained, by looking at the chiral carbon that is the farthest away from the carbonyl group. So it is essential that if you don't remember what chirality is or how to determine what is a chiral carbon, Make sure that you review that. All of that comes from your background in organic chemistry. Now, when we are going to be comparing these two molecules, so for example, here we have L erythros versus D erythros. And when we look at it in terms of stereochemistry, what does that mean? If you have the molecule 
of L erythros compared to D erythros, they are actually enantiomers of each other. And by definition, remember that enantiomers are going to be mirror images of each other and the two molecules are non super impossible that means that if you take the molecule on the right and you try to line it up by putting on top of the molecule that we have on the left they will not overlap. So, again, it, uh, the word enantiomer is something that it doesn't ring a bell. Please go and review that from uh, sources, from textbooks in organic chemistry. Now, there is another relationship that monosaccharides can have to each other, and that is epimers. By definition, an epimer is going to be a diastereomer that is going to differ from each other in the absolute configuration at only one chiral center. So I just wanted to give you guys some examples of epimers. So when we look at glucose, this is the structure of D-glucose. So D-glucose, we are going to be comparing to D-mannose, and we're going to be comparing to D-galactose. Mannose and galactose are also examples of monosaccharides. Remember, I just uh, want to, because we just discussed it, review. The D is because the OH that is in the, uh, the chiral carbon that is the farthest away from the carbonyl is on the right. So that's why... As you can see, this is D-glucose, this is D-galactose. Now, when we compare mannose to glucose, the molecules look pretty much the same, okay? The only thing is that at carbon 2, the OH is going to be on the left, okay? And if we look at carbon 2, 3, 4, um, and five, that is the only difference between mannose and glucose. If we observe the difference between glucose and galactose, carbon two looks the same, carbon three looks the same, carbon four, now the OH is on the left, carbon five, the OH looks the same. So galactose is also an epimer of glucose. So in this example, Mannose and galactose are epimers of glucose because we are comparing both of the corner molecules to the center one. Another thing that I wanted um, to point out when it comes to monosaccharides is something that I've been mentioning since the beginning of this lecture is the number of chiral centers that we have in a monosaccharide. And I'm just going to outline the chiral centers in mannose, for example. The chiral centers present in mannose include carbon-2, three, four, and five. So understand that even though these molecules have more than one chiral center, the overall configuration between D and L is only determined by DOH that it is in the last, okay? Chiral carbon, meaning the one that is the farthest away from the carbonyl. Now, 
One of the things that is a special property when it comes to monosaccharides is that monosaccharides, if they have an open form, meaning that they have a Fischer projection, remember that first molecule that we have on the left is the Fischer projection. And understand that what happens to a monosaccharide that it is in open form it can, is that it actually can form pentose and hexose sugars that are five or six atoms. And understand that when they have this cyclized forms, these rings, they're known as Hayworth structures. So the last molecule that we have here is going to be representing a Hayworth structure. Now, how are they produced? As you can see, is from the reaction of, I'm just going to highlight the atoms, the carbonyl, okay, in this case is being represented by the aldehyde because we're talking about glucose. So it's going to be produced from the reaction of the carbonyl group and the hydroxyl group, okay, that is what makes a molecule be D or L, okay? And what results from that, as you can see, is this group right here. And understand that the product of the reaction is called a hemiacetal ring. This is not an ether, okay? This is called a hemiacetal ring because from organic chemistry, you already previously learned that when you react an alcohol group, okay, which is basically the hydroxyl group in the alcohol with a carbonyl, that produces a hemiacetal. Now, Understand that that carbon number one, which is what it used to be the carbonyl group, now is a new chiral center. So I'm just going to um, write it in the molecule in the bottom. I'm just going to highlight it. So this carbon that I highlighted in red is a new chiral center. So the molecule started with four chiral centers. Once it cyclizes into a Hayward structure, has five chiral centers. And depending on the position of the OH group, we can have an alpha form or a beta form of our monosaccharide. To just give you guys a little abbreviation of how to determine if my Hayworth projection shows me an alpha form or a beta form, Understand that we can learn that by looking at the acronym Buddha, meaning beta, up, down, alpha, meaning that as you can see, The OH in the alpha form is pointing down. So I'm just going to highlight it down alpha. My OH is pointing down. Beta up means that my OH at the anomeric position, because that is the name of this new chiral center. It's called anomeric position or anomeric um, center. Um, so if my OH at my anomeric position, our anomeric carbon is pointing up, then that means that that is the beta form for my monosaccharide. In addition, understand that when this cyclization processes are happening between 
the alcohol that determines the DNL configuration and the carbonyl that is present in the molecule. And understand that these cyclizations can happen with aldoses and it can also happen with ketoses. Okay. Now, understand that the Hayworth structures are going uh, or have the ability to produce two different types of rings. We are going to be able to see pyranose rings versus furanose rings. Okay. So when we look at the difference between the two, as you can see, a pyranose ring is going to have six atoms in the ring. In the furanose ring, we're going to have five atoms in the ring. And that is the difference between pyranoses and furanoses. Okay. Now, as you can see, in addition to that, you can have alpha or beta because this group is what determines alpha or beta. Now, it depends on what we have, either an aldohexose or a ketohexose, what is going to be the preference for forming a pyranose versus a furanose. So I just wanted to illustrate an example of specifically how we have here an aldohexose an open chain. And as you can see in these three different conformations for monosaccharides, understand that the open chain is going to be in a low percentage. So monosaccharides don't like to be in open form. When it comes to the furanoses, as you can see, that is also a low percentage, at least specifically for an aldohexose. When it comes to aldohexoses, as you can see, forming that pyranose ring is going to be better for the structure because when we are comparing furanose rings versus pyranose rings, understand that a furanose ring are going to be more planar. So the angles that our atoms are going to have are not going to be close to 109.5. Remember that each one of these carbons are going to be tetrahedral. So the goal is to be 109.5. When we look at a pyranose ring, those molecules can actually pucker and they can form chair conformations. And chair conformations have the ability that once the chair conformation forms, the atoms within the ring will be able to achieve that angle of 109.5 that is very desirable if you are a tetrahedral center.